Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Today, we're very happy to have Maria Rodriguez. She's going to tell us about dynamical love numbers for Kerr Blackwood. Hey, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here at this MSA. Um, I will be discussing um, a topic that has been taking, um, you know, um, that I have been collaborating with different groups. Uh, and in particular, uh, this uh, topic, dynamical love numbers, which uh, is a collaboration that I'm, uh, I work with uh, Malcolm uh, Curry. So um, the plan for today, is um do i need to upset okay sounds good and if there's any anything on the chat just let me um okay so sorry the motivations uh the outline for today uh are going to come with this uh, following points i will start with some motivation um in general about title informations how we define then how we can them in objects uh, in the sky or in, um, in, in general relativity in particular. And uh, the concern or the, the topic today will be uh, about tidal informations of black holes in particular. But I will try to motivate the topic. Um, the second point is going to be a very brief review, basically two slides to give you an idea of what the discussion has been uh, in relation to something called the love numbers. And I will define them for you uh, more technically. And in particular, uh, the static love numbers, which are going to be a bit different than the dynamical love numbers, which are going to be the ones that I uh, you know, uh, worked on on this paper with, with Malcolm. And I want to also stress and um, describe them later. Some of the references uh, in here uh, are in this ones. Um, so this one's these two um, uh, papers here are going to be part of the symmetries that are argued to justify why this coefficient or the tidal deformations of black holes are zero. And what we will do today with this um, paper uh, that we wrote with Malcolm is uh, going to argue that, in fact, perhaps there is some additional symmetries that could lead to this um, um, analysis of which are the symmetries relevant for the tidal deformations in black holes. And as we will see, this one's are going to be interesting in the context as well of holography, which are the ones that you have seen in the past with the hidden, um, so with curves uh, or extensions of that uh, and so on. These ones are, are different. I will clarify the differences a bit uh, for you. So before going to like the more technical details, I wanted to give you a motivation and a bit of the idea of what uh, this process means. So basically the fundamental idea is that any object that you put in a gravitational field, an external gravitational field, say um, this object here, a black hole in here, um, is going to be affected by any other object. It could be a black hole or another compact object, yes? So you put your uh, object of interest in an external gravitational field, and in principle, this could be deformed. It will feel that deformation, it will get squeezed. So one of the big questions has to do with whether are, we are allowed actually to tidally deform a black hole. So if black holes are actually nothing, they're just boundaries that many of us thinkers you know, uh, see them uh, in, in theoretical physics, well, are we going to really see any tidal deformations of black holes in particular? Yes. So some of the questions one could start asking in this context is whether we can deform them. And if we can, how can we characterize these deformations? Okay. So that is what I'm going to define for you. And um, the idea is that when we do this characterization, is trying to see and decode some of the patterns that this uh, tidal deformations or these 
ways of characterizing these deformations have, in particular, symmetry, so universal features of these um, deformations. So um, one of the things that is important to understand from all this um, you know, big question is not just that the tidal deformations are a question of whether yes or not kind of answer, whether we can or we cannot tidally deform them. They will teach us a lot more about the object being deformed, a lot more that we think, in particular, the internal structure of the objects. So could we, by studying tidal deformations, understand the internal structure of black holes? Would that be possible? OK. So before we go and jump to black holes, let me um, define in a sentence tidal deformations. And here we have a picture of, of the Earth, um, where there is um, only an ocean surrounding it. But we put another object close to the, um, the Earth, and we see that due to the effects of the gravitational effect of the moon on the Earth, there's going to be some deformation, yes? So a tidal deformation is in general a gravitational phenomenon that uh, is caused by uh, and, or causes a body to stretch in a line towards uh, the, the center of mass of the second object uh, here. And so this is a result of the differences and the spatial variations of the gravitational field along that object. Here, there's a tidal bulge in the ocean. So the water gets um, you know, uh, tidally deformed by the moon more easily. There's also a tidal deformation of the solid part of Earth. It's not as visible as you know, what we see in the oceans. And it will have a big, big effect, both things. The tidal deformation of the soft part or the liquid part of the Earth will have to do with the waves that we see in the ocean, for example. If you remember from interstellar, there were big, big tidal deformations and big waves. Um, and here also, it will tell us a bit about what the object, the solid part, would also get deformed, not in such a visible way, but it will have an effect, and it will have an effect of um, a, a, a bit um, related to the fact of what this object is made out of. Yeah, so can we squeeze the earth very much, or can we cannot? Obviously, the moon will also get some tidal deformations. They are not painted here, they're very small as well. And the moon doesn't have a liquid core, so it doesn't really deform too much. It did have in the past, this is what we think. Now, some effects that are super interesting are the ones that we see also in the solar system. So there are planets as well, and planets do have moons. And in particular, one of these the tidal deformations effects has been uh, very well studied with Jupiter and Io, one of the moons. Io is, um, um, is highly deformed by Jupiter, and the effects of the tidal deformation are so strong that because it has a liquid core, it is causing volcanoes to erupt. So it's really like squeezing of the material that you see, plus internal friction and other things that go on heating, right? Because this is a huge, huge uh, deformation that uh, you can see, yes? So it tells us a bit about what they're made out of. In a different context, uh, last year or beginning of this year, there were the results of these uh, CUBES um, information or, or satellites or, um, that uh, what they were measuring was a tidal squeezing, not in our solar system, but in other uh, systems, exoplanets in our galaxy. And what they found actually is that their moons surrounding one of these uh, host of the um, stars here that are basically like um, American football. Yes. So the moons are of that size. So the effect is not something local if, uh, in our planet or that we see in our solar system. It's also something measurable. And this is super interesting in our galaxy within the exoplanets. 
one of the data that came out, uh, I think a few months ago or two months ago, is uh, this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And what you see here is the title, not the formation of the black holes, but you see now this at the level of the galaxies. This is a true picture. There's no, you know, uh, image of artists doing anything. So you see that there's a galaxy here and there's a second galaxy. And so by tidal deformations, they're still not touching. The gravitational effects are so big that uh, they are some, uh, you know, um, content of one galaxy moving to the other and so forth. So they're already interacting as though they haven't really crashed one into the other. So one of, of the things one could ask is uh, what happens to these black holes. In particular, the black holes at the center of these galaxies. So if each galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center, could actually the distortion or the tidal deformation of the supermassive black hole with this one start interacting and actually have a tidal effect in there. So those are some examples where we could find um, black holes. Um, there's also combinations of black holes with neutron stars. We know that there's going to be tidal disruption, for example, in stars. And the question is whether in these binary systems, for example, that LIGO is measuring for the stellar mass black holes, not the supermassive black holes, uh, could there be also some tidal deformation? So let's jump to black holes and look more technically what we are going to uh, be looking at, okay? So in general, we are going to set up the problem in a way where we are going to have a black hole in um, the external uh, field of another object. <clears throat> in particular here, I said uh, something, a compact object, it could be a black hole or a neutron star. So it doesn't really matter for the coefficients that we are going to be defining um, later uh, in, in the next slide uh, for black holes, but some other external field, yes, in which this uh, black hole that uh, has its, its scale, it has a radius. So how we define the radius is for the uh, the, the object that is not uh, tightly distorted, that's going to be the reference kind of scale of the problem here. And then uh, there are going to be different uh, aspects. So we are going to only be detecting a zone that is the black hole zone. We are not going to describe the full problem where we have both black holes. And sometimes what we are going to do is to set up the scale uh, of where the uh, object that is creating the external gravitational uh, field is at R over Rs, so a dimensionless uh, scale, if you want, uh, like this, so we can um, do uh, an expansion in that parameter for the distance of the body. So we're going to see ratios like this in the expansion. And then um, what we are going to be doing in this case when we now look at the dynamical lab numbers is that when the systems are actually in a binary system, we're going to be in a regime where the, the gravitational external field will not vary very quickly, yes? So the periods in which this uh, external gravitational field changes in time is going to be a regime where these changes are not very large. Yes? So those are there. So in general, if we take the potential, uh, the external potential uh, for a point um, in uh, the center of mass, so this level has mass um, um, capital M in here, and this is our scale R, and this will be sort of the Newtonian uh, potential for that mass. And so all the other uh, contributions are going to be of two uh, sorts, if you want. So if there's going to be uh, terms that go like R to the L, that is going to uh, be basically the external field that is producing a deformation. And so the the ones that is the reaction of the body to these external fields are going to be um, of order R to the minus L, right? In case I'll need to multiply that. Um, this is the expansion that you get for the uh, gravitational external potential, where we have here the typical 
um, coefficients for the um, polynomials, the spherical part, and ELM are going to be the multiple moments. Yes. So the reason why we look at this equation was going to be basically in this multiple decomposition of the tidal deformations of the optics are these coefficients here, these KLMs, yes? So these coefficients, KLMs, are going to be the coefficients that are called the Luff numbers, yes? And are going to be intrinsically defined by the parameters of the object being defined. Everything else about the other object that is causing it will be somewhere here. So the coefficients are dimensionless. And they are going to tell us what the object is um, in some way, um, how the object is basically reacting to the external field. Questions? Okay, so um, these tidal deformations are very big deformations, and they could actually change the orbits of where they're, you know. Kind of moving around. Tidal deformation is not simply something about the object uh, in, in itself. And it promises to tell us uh, these KLNs, um, it promises to give us a description of what they are made out of. It's kind of unexpected effects for black holes. We don't really know what to really know or define internally in the structure. But for the neutron stars in here, they will give us information to write the equation of state that is not known, yes? And that is an input that one has to kind of uh, put a dock for the neutron stars. So knowing the love numbers show up there. For black holes and the neutron stars, or for every object, also these love numbers show up in the gravitational waves, yes? So as we increase the precision of the gravitational wave detections, we're going to need to compute these love numbers in a way. And maybe they show us a bit of whether we are dealing with general relativity, if we are not, if we're dealing with a star, if we're dealing with um, a black hole. Maria, how did you know that the Ks wouldn't depend on the source term? Normally the response term doesn't depend on Right. Yeah, so the the way this this is in the Newtonian kind of description, but uh, this this way um, of this decomposition is well known in some way. You a priori you could you could ask or say, can we define these coefficients in general relativity, how we see them, and do they depend on the other source? It will end up being that no. They are not dependent on the source that you have. But even in the Newtonian pro problem, where you could ask that as well, we know that all the other, you know, kind of dependence is singled out in the uh, uh, in the multiple uh, decomposition. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Put all the is. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, all the dependence is there. This was. This so let me for like in general, all so the love the, the reason why this name is called the love numbers or these coefficients are called like this are due to a mathematician at Oxford at the beginning of, of the century. And he 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 did a lot of research about elasticity of objects, and he realized that one could define this uh, coefficients in particular for stars, and that was how, in fact, in astronomy, we know that, uh, you know, this, this coefficients can be defined for the stars and they sometimes help in defining what the stars are made out of. Yes. And so um, th this is not something new in the context of astronomy in general. It is new when we apply it to black holes and how we can sort of understand them uh, for, for these objects. Yes. If you want to recommend up this love, I was thinking it's maybe like love within the external field. Yeah, it's, it is, it is. <laughs> and I think some of some of the authors typically play with that uh, fact, but it's it's the name. Um yeah. So um and and um and on the note of, of stars and planets, these KLMs are never zero. 
Yes, first timers in general. Okay. Um, let's see. Did my computer freeze? No. Okay. So, what do we do in general relativity, and how we define this uh, eventually for for the black holes? Well, the story here, we need a little bit of more math than just pictures. So we can write uh, the geometry of the totally deformed object that we want uh, in a, and, and consider some linear perturbation to, and here it looks like in C, but in general it could be your black hole geometry, say a Schwarzschild black hole or a Kerr black hole. And you want to see what the perturbation could do. Uh, to that black hole, if you consider the black hole being embedded in an external gravitational field, one can linearize um, Einstein's equations and uh, use a definition, uh, a special definition of the perturbation. So you, you go to the search bar uh, thing and consider some gauge choice. And in the end, what one sees is that the equations, the linearized Einstein's equations, can be written uh, of, of, uh, in this form. Yes. So if we put on the right hand side <coughs> a kind like source, we can compute what the tidal deformation is uh, for the black hole or the metric that, that you want to a linearized order. And so how, how does that kind of come in the context further? Is this perturbations? We can split them in three if you want. Yes, H mu nu can be split in three. And the HTT component, actually, when we write a nearest Einstein's equations, it becomes Tolkowski's equation or the Klein Gordon equation of a scalar field. Yes. So HTT component times two, depending on what the um, definition is for HTT, is going to be, or the equations, the nearest Einstein's equations for this component decouple. Yes. And they decouple in a way that one ends on the Tchaikovsky equation for the perturbation in the TT component becomes the scalar equation. Yes. So this is the reason why you'll see in all the papers the scalar equation for the problem, which is linked also in some cases to quasi normal modes and stability and so on. But in here, it really means the perturbation of your geometry in here. And of course, if I want to do the tidal deformation of the entire metric, we need to kind of see what happens with the other components of, of the perturbations. But it happens that the Ti components, they're vector perturbations, and they decouple in one type of equation, the linearized uh, equations. And then there are some tensor components, yes? And one has to deal as well. I'm not going to do any vectors or tensors in here. I'm just going to do the scalar part of the TT component of it. Uh, and, and this is what the discussion is going to be today. But that's the link between those objects. So what I want to say is that in general, we think that black holes are characterized by two parameters. And this, this is actually true. But what happens is that if we put in them in a, an external field, we will have to kind of give an account of the perturbations because they're all actually going, this new geometry is going to be a solution of Einstein's equations of the same theory, yes, that we have. And so they will be um, a bit more special. And so we expect them to have a different shape. So the, the problem then for the deformations, how we how we do this uh, more concretely, well, we take the scalar equation and here um, I've um, generalized it to photonic screens, so for the massless uh, scalar and S uh, equals zero, one or two. The ones that are going to be in the geometry are going to be the gravitons. So the S equals two in this problem, yes, eventually. But we can generalize and look at what the equation is and see how we can solve it in more generality. And there, there are boundary conditions that, so, oh, sorry, one, one can then, uh, in the geometries of Schwarzschild or Kerr, it is very famously known that if one uh, imposes an ansatz in Moyard Linkless coordinates, one can propose an ansatz for the scalar in this way, where we have some omega t 
here we have uh, omega is going to be the frequency, m is going to be the parameter that goes with the phi as the monotonal direction, the eigenvalue. There's an r and a theta part uh, that uh, are going to all be coupled if you want, or uh, coupled in, in a linear way. And we're going to impose some boundary conditions. So basically the idea is to find the solutions for the equation up there with this specific boundary conditions in a way to read off the love numbers. So how do we do that? So we find the solution to the scalar equation and on the boundary of your black hole, because you want a black hole, there's nothing that is allowed to actually be scattered out. So you, you impose ingoing boundary conditions at the horizon. And the horizon here is my R plus in this way of, of labeling things. Um, and so one is going to impose that. And once one has this solution, one can analytically continue. One can think about how we could extend this solution and know something without having to solve at the boundary for that. And so there is a trick to do that by an analytical continuation of that. And the same function, one reads of what the behavior is in the boundary at R infinity in this case is. And one can see that uh, from, from here, the radial uh, part of this wave function is going to have this behavior. And because it has this follows uh, for this uh, second uh, term at, at the boundary, one can read off this love number coefficients from there. Yes. So that is how we are going to be uh, defining those. The function, the function that you're 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 solving your function and setting. So, um, let's uh, let, let me clarify something. So, the if we if we knew how to solve the radial wave equation exactly for here, which we don't, yes, then that would be it. We don't need an analytical continuation. So typically what one needs to do is to solve close to the horizon in some approximation, and then you continue, analytically continue your radial function from that is valid in the near zone or close to the black hole, to a region where you were not studying these things, but there was some overlap where the function is uh, identified or one can identify things related to these left numbers. So it's not even added up, it's just matching. It's matching. It's matching. Yeah. 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 Barak call, likes yeah. to call it analytical continuation. It's a matching. Yeah. <laughs> the analytical continuation will happen. Um, and I will not discuss it uh, because one can complexify some of the parameters. Right. And in that way, you're not really doing a matching, you're really doing an analytical continuation. Yeah. I will just do match uh, in here. But some papers have been using that as synonyms of one to the other. And also, the equation should also depend on x, right? It's not yes. Plus yes. Plus yeah. So it, it depends. In S um, here, so the the parameter. Well, I mean the the equation, the Laplacian does not. Is the care black hole? The function will depend, and when you this is the full Laplacian. Is the partial dt? I haven't yet acted with the operator on the scalar. Yeah, but there's yeah, I thought that the terms in the equation that the next. Okay, let's look at the equation in a minute. It could be, yes, or it could be that it depends in here. I'm not trying to this is a schematic. Uh I'm not trying to be very precise in here. It's just to give you um some idea. Okay, so there has been some claims, and probably you know that love numbers vanish for pair black holes. So what do we mean, and what is the story around this uh, story? 
So here's the thing. So the first considerations that people did was to take the radial equation and said, okay, let's put the black hole in a static external field. So how do you do that? Well, basically, if your um, background is static, the reaction, the perturbation is not going to be time dependent. So you, the only thing you need to do is solve the scalar equation with omega equals to zero. Yes? And when you do that, you can do that exactly because the care black hole with omega equals to zero is a Hoyn type of equation and you can solve it exactly. So we have hypergeometric functions as solutions of that. And we know how to play this game as going further out into the boundary and define this tidal coefficients that um, are defined for the care black hole, yes? So those are the static responses to a static external field. Now, the question that we wanted to address is what happens when omega is not zero, when the gravitational field outside is varying with time. So the tidal coefficients now will acquire a dependence on omega. Yes, it will be omega dependent as well. And what we are going to be seeing is basically that there's a difference for black holes, at least, between an external field being static or dynamic, where the reaction of the object is going to be a bit different. One of the things one uh, has to um, also here define is that the gravitational tidal coefficients have a real and an imaginary part, yes? And the uh, conservative part, the one that is the real part of those coefficients, are going to be the love numbers. Yes, if one wants to be very, very cautious about how you define this, these are going to be your love numbers, strictly. And the imaginary bits are going to be the dissipative effects. So if the object does not deform, but it actually is going to dissipate out all the deformation are going to be <laughs> defined in this uh, here. Yes, and in this imaginary case. Uh, I, this is my labeling. Everyone has used their own labeling for what they call the love, meaning the symbols here for the kappa and, and so on. And in some papers, um, and in the world of astronomy, people call sometimes love numbers the entire thing. <laughs> so there's there's a bit of, of there, uh, that. But the reason I specify this is because I was very confused when I started working on this about the computation. So when one does this computation for the care black hole in the static background, one can read off the love number, and what sees that the real part of that, the reaction is actually zero. It's not zero because it cancels, is that the title is KLN doesn't have a real part, yes? But it does have a non-zero imaginary bit, yes? So when people say the love number vanishes, they're referring to the real part of the title coefficients. But there's here in the static case is also going to have this static dissipation coefficient. Yes, with omega equals to zero even, yeah? So love number vanishes, but the dissipation does not. And, um, you know, is this a realization of something more fundamental? When you get zero in physics, it shows something very special happening. And so some of the ideas behind this is whether symmetries can be actually the reason why you would start getting zero on the nose for the love numbers of, of these black holes. So if the love numbers were non vanishing, what physical effect does that have? Well, the fact is that this is what we're going to see in the dynamical case. But uh, this is what I'm going to show you. I don't, I'm don't. i not going to claim I can say what's happening internally in the black hole. Yes, yet. But um, what we can see is that if the static left numbers are zero, they should show up in the gravitational wave. So in the gravitational wave, detection of the binary system, having a zero will really tell you that that's not there. So it will characterize the black hole as being a very special object, 
But if you don't get zero of this order in the omega equals to zero case, could be two things. It could be that it's not a black hole if you believe in general relativity or that general relativity is needs some modification. That's really bad. Yeah? Yes. So this is this is that. Does that answer? I didn't answer. I said whatever I wanted. But also there's a cross section of So yeah, cross section and cross section. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see, and this is what I want to show you, that the love numbers, the real part, are not going to be zero when the gravitational field is kind of finite. Okay, so it's only going to be zero when um, it, it is uh, static. Okay, some of that we knew already. What are going to kind of think about is more also about the the symmetries. Okay, this is a plot only of the dissipation. I just wanted to see how, and this is the, the parameter that I had, the Nigerian bit. Uh, what happens if we uh, fix the mass of the black holes to, to n equals one in here? And I looked at some of the values uh, for the scalar uh, case. And so what happens is we increase the value of L there's some special structure in higher dimensions, so I thought maybe care has it too, but it doesn't. So as we increase the value of L, what happens is um, that the uh, coefficients, the dissipation becomes to uh, be becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes. This is the multiple, if you want, contributions of that. But as the spin, if we look at L equals one, and this is at all values of L, we increase the spin of the black hole. The black hole is better at dissipating. Yes. So that is uh, kind of what's uh, shown in there. So what's the story with the symmetry? Yes. Um, so this is this is the thing. So here was that because we're analyzing the uh, scalar equation, we're not talking about symmetries of the geometry itself. There is the hidden symmetry. So the symmetries of the wave equation that we're dealing with. And so there were two groups and two ideas that uh, showed that actually there is some hidden symmetry that one could argue um, gives rise to the zero value of the static lot numbers which is a symmetry that is not the one that you're used to, but it's similar to that. So it does have a component that has an SL2 R times a U1, yes? And so the paper is um, the paper on, on love symmetry, yes? And then there's an, another uh, symmetry that has and gives the same argument of having a zero symmetry uh, um, a zero vanishing of the love number that has to do with an SL4,2. And you can find the reference in here. Yeah. So I will, to distinguish this too, um, I, I will call on people in some papers refer to them as the love symmetry and Starobinsky symmetry or effective, if you want, uh, geometries that one is looking at close to the horizon. In four dimensions. So what you do is you the symmetry. So you you uh, the symmetry only shows up in a certain regime close to the horizon. If you want, these are not extremal black holes. These are the full thing of care black holes. But you assume that uh, the frequency. So omega is going to be zero because this is you know, going to do uh, static, but you're close to the horizon in different ways, yes? And you're not close to the horizon and seeing these symmetries effectively in the geometry, you're going to see them at the level of the equation of motion, of, of the scalar equation, yeah? So there are symmetries of the um, scalar equation that we want to analyze. Yeah. Okay, so if one does play this um, this game here with the symmetries, one could also create um, some operators that one and, and one could justify 
that uh, one can go and compute the love numbers that are dynamical, yes, in an extension of the symmetries in here, and compute what, what those uh, dynamical love numbers are. So what ends up happening in that computation is that the love numbers have no real part. This is an imaginary number all the time. So it is, and so part of the claim that love numbers are zero is that in the extension of the symmetries to the case of omega equals not zero, then the love numbers would always vanish. If your black hole has or produces these hidden symmetries in the equation, then they would have vanishing love numbers. So KLM here is not zero, but if one is careful about analyzing this, this is only imaginary. Yeah? Okay. So this was one computation that happened in the last year, year and a half, or two years. But if we analyze further out in you know the literature, there's uh, some analysis of the equation, not now in the context of love symmetries, which is solving the scalar equation in some low frequency regime. Yes, and this is much older. You see, it's ninety six. Yeah, so we're talking about a completely different, you know, um, uh, problem, which was more simple. It was very humble. It was, uh, you know, let's solve the scalar equation with not numerical methods, which we can do, but analytically. Yes. So in that paper, what they did was to think and analyze this a very technical uh, paper uh, of whether we can construct the scalar uh, as a sum of hypergeometric functions and set up the problem in a more structured way with some coefficients and try to figure out whether we can solve it in some regime, in particular, the low frequency regime, yes? So now if you take this order of results and uh, Misha Ivanov um, at, at MIT and uh, now and, and people uh, in the group, which I haven't cited here, but you can see the reference in mind. Uh, what they did was to take that information and read off from there what actually the love numbers should be in that very different low frequency context. And they find actually that the love numbers in that it become this um, uh, object here, a lot more complicated structure. And in particular, it has some log contribution. Yes. Okay. So the love numbers have a log contribution. And there's some omega dependence, not only in two of these gamma functions, but actually four of them. Yes. And so this is like the very, very whole problem story where you're not doing any near zone approximation or symmetries or hidden symmetries or anything. You're, you're, or, uh, you're really doing the honest computation of, of solving that. So apparently what happens is that none of the symmetries were going to get you this low frequency solutions in the problem. Yes. And so this is where we started looking and, and thinking about the, the problem with Malcolm. Um, and uh, I'm not going to discuss the, uh, the ways of defining this. And so this is what, what we did. So we wanted to see now what the tidal deformation is for the black holes. Um, Upstairs at the BHI, they love the movies. So now I'm doing my movies with PowerPoint. So you see the dynamical effect uh, right now. Okay, and so we thought, okay, let's let's try a, a kind of a CFT inspired computation, and let's take the um, the Klein-Gordon equation for for this scalar or the Topolsky equation um, for the scalar. In this regime, and there are several papers that did that in the pure CFT context, this is not extreme, this is a very general uh, thing. But now, instead of doing those symmetries that I told you, we'll keep some SL2R into SL2R symmetry. Yeah. And uh, so there's a, a, a paper of um, Andy, uh, Alejandra, and Alex that look at that in that regime. 
So we looked at this and said, okay, let's try to figure out if we can compute the log numbers that obey this symmetry. So um, to do that, one can see that this is the symmetry that one gets. And so technically what we need to do is um, do a few kind of things. So there's coordinate transformation, there's a field redefinition, and then one can identify A, B, and C from that equation and rewrite the radial part of the symmetry. And this is a hidden symmetry, it's not exact, right? At all, you asked me about like matching. So I'm going to chop, if you want, some of the terms in that approximation, as the other two papers did in a different way. Yes. And uh, you can write this equation in, in the hypergeometric form or the Fox uh, type of, of equation. And so uh, the solutions to the hyper, there are two solutions, is a linear um, second order differential operator, it has two solutions. So once uh, you get uh, those two solutions, you need to set up the bound recognition. So what you do is you take your radial equation, you put some boundary that is going to be your event horizon. And so the one that has the ingoing boundary condition, so you kill basically one of them, I think in the paper we did that one here. And you keep this one. So you plug in what A, B, and C are, and this is what you get for the radial equation. Yes. So once you have the ingoing boundary conditions in there, you can uh, do an analytical continuation, which is not exactly what we did. But what we did was to look at the way to represent this equation, if you want, in another base in the boundary. Yes. So. That is what you see here. And what happens if one is careful enough is that actually the equation has this gamma functions and this log. Yeah. But it's missing in Andy's paper uh, in here. So this is the log actually. And, and when we saw that, we actually realized that that could be the log that was missing in this kind of computation with the symmetries. So now we can read off from here the, um, the coefficients and get the, the tidal coefficient. So basically the tidal coefficients is the ratio of this uh, divided by this in here. Yeah, and so these are these coefficients here and you get some log terms there. So let's, let's check some, some things uh, in here. So this is how the expression looks like. It looks very complicated. Um, but already you see that uh, there are some gammas that have these omega dependence uh, already and the law. And so one can rewrite it in, in this way if one plays around with the gamma definitions in there. So uh, there are a few comments here about the care uh, dynamical coefficients. So we can do an expansion in omega and small omega now and try to see whether we can build the whole tower and what they kind of look like. Yes. So the first order in here, ignore this if you want a line thing here, says that uh, we do have uh, in here some uh, love number already at frequency omega to the uh, first, yeah, no, contribution. No, 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 no. Say that again? Yeah, already approximating, approximating the small omega. This tells you this is a uh, It is on my own omega times r. Mm -hmm. But also I know this this uh, this log numbers will are not going to be valid uh for all frequency values if this is so it's going to be broken the symmetry at some point. What I'm just saying is taking this, and I want to see if I recover to small frequency, what the, not just the log part of it, but also exactly the same structure that it was found. But it's going to be valid because it was assume and think the omega times m should be small. Right? Yeah, it's going to be valid. Mm -hmm. It's not omega times m only. Is this two yeah, things? Mm -hmm. So we are already assuming that omega is really small, right? Yeah. 
I'm going to argue yes, and then give me one second. Sorry. So, um, okay, for uh, care, what we see is that, uh, and, and this is not going to be valid to all orders of omega, yes, and it's going to be broken, but at least at zero and first order, you can see some behavior that will give you some hints about what the reaction is of the black holes. What is interesting here and shows part of the symmetry uh, kind of coming up is that the love numbers are going, so nu equals zero is the definitive part of the zero color of the static um, um, love number. And so all the tower of the different, not only the love numbers, which are the real bits, but also the symmetric part are going to be proportional to the love number that is actually proportional to the symmetric part. So they're all kind of looped around. They're all proportional to the non-zero tidal coefficient of the static um, case, yes, in there. Uh, there are some uh, things that are represented here. So there's no dependence, there's no dissipation for the scalar, but it will happen with the gravitational and the S equals one uh, case. Um, there's some statement here uh, about the universality uh, of, of the black holes behaving like a rigid rotating um, problem. But I was going to point out that in fact, it is this expression here at the low frequency that matches exactly this elder competition for 96 that Misha kind of read off from there, the love numbers, exactly. So independently of whether you know the love numbers are true zeros or not true zeros, it seems that at the low frequency in this problem, there is some symmetry that one can argue gives you, and it's this SL2R and SL2R that is showing uh, up in, in kind of a pure general relativity computation in there. Oh, okay, here are the bubbles of that uh, thing in there. And then what we did is, because we could we could play around with the parameters as well and um, look at what happens if we look at the Schwarzschild case, at least from the coefficients itself. And so we can take the spin parameter to zero, then what happens is the inner horizon lies at R equals naught, and you recover the outer horizon to be 2M for Schwarzschild, and one gets uh, this, um, now, what we did was to make a comparison, and there's in the literature this idea of looking at the perturbations of your geometry. Yeah, there's a paper by Poisson from last year or two years ago. I don't remember exactly. And so what, what's done in here are the perturbations to post-Newtonian uh, perturbations of, of the geometry. And so one sees that in this is their labeling in, in the paper in here, they compute this in a, in a more sophisticated way with post-Newtonian. And what they find is in particular that the first, uh, this is time dependence, yes. Um, uh, the dependence in the geometry for that coefficient in there, or Schwarzschild has this form. And when we look at what happens uh, in, you know, when we do uh, the limits of uh, omega equals to zero, four hours for Schwarzschild, we get exactly the same coefficient that was co computed in the post-Newtonian uh, approximation for the tidal deformations of the Schwarzschild black hole. Yes? Okay, so that is sort of that bit. Um, now, for instances of, of having the symmetry, the symmetry of the SL2R spicy also this idea of having maybe some CFT that one can build from this um, um, story. And so one of the things one can compute is the, if you want the love numbers that are going to be just proportional to the retarded gains function in the context of of the CFT. And so if one takes uh, the left and the right definitions for the temperatures of your CFT and the frequencies also left and right moving 
in, in this way, one can write the expression that we had before exactly in this way that is very symmetric in, in left and right movers. And uh, one can compare that and, and see the dual, if you want, representation of, of the love numbers as well. Yes, it will have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and how to write you if there is a CFD. If there is a CFD. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which, uh, again, is going to be broken at certain points. We know that. But in certain regimes, probably you will find uh, this the symmetries behind all the story. Can I ask? So Misha and Sergey, the computer collections in Swan Olga, I and what you're saying is that the, the, the same collections in Swan Olga are captured by this symmetry. But it's not it's not captured by so even though Misha did the computation with this older paper right. from '96. It wasn't captured by the symmetries of the love symmetries or the, yeah. the SL2R, the one or the other. Okay. So that's that's kind of uh, that. What I'm saying is that if we if we want to argue that perhaps there is some symmetry behind the all the story of, of the zero love numbers, it may be more likely that it's more related to the SL2R than the SL2R because we can make this computation and, and see that, not only in the context of what Misha did of, of looking at the low frequency, but also in looking to make a comparison with the post-Newtonian expansions that we have. So where you ask what happens at higher order in the omega expansion, yes, whether it's valid or not, you could take all the post-Newtonian computations. They haven't gone very much up. The problem is very, very complicated in here. And make the comparison and see where you start seeing that there's there's some breaking of that. But, but this computation is valid to first order in omega. The first correction. No, no, it, it is to second order. As second, well. but that's a first. That's a first. No, to second or, or or higher order because the the wave equation is uh doesn't have higher orders of omega. The max the, the, the biggest number is omega squared. So no, the, but I mean. The computation of Misha is to second order in all. But that's also question, but also this, because that, that assumes that omega is small. So. But that omega is small, it doesn't mean that it's not valid to higher order. I don't understand what you're saying. It's Something can be small. Say that again. It, it's an approximation, you assume. It. And it's not small omega, it's omega times r. Right? Yeah, but also omega times 10. Yes, yeah. but that doesn't mean that omega is only valid to first order. Well, I, I mean, a parameter can be small, but it could be valid that your solution is, is valid for a few more terms. Not straight. I mean, it could be that the symmetry breaks up already at higher order, but it could be that it's not the case. I think this is a process of law is valid within this approximation. Yes. So we are saying within this approximation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not claiming that this symmetry will be valid for all frequencies yeah. and all also, orders. I think it's a reason to believe it to the extent we you know. A zero, a zero energy, zero omega, there is only zero, so that was the motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? But beyond zero and frequency. Well, it does, because it's, it's giving you exactly, at least yeah. to first order. Right, but, in, but more generally. In Higher orders. Yeah. Well, one one should do the check. How, where where does it break? Right. Yes. We can check. Uh, I don't know the question of where where it breaks. Uh, what what is the order at which it breaks? I don't know. I don't think you can yet claim that it doesn't. I mean, but if there is a reason to believe that the symmetry I don't know. Well, we think there's, there's, you know, probably some, you know, symmetry, but um, 
I don't know. There's no pattern that you see, right? It didn't show up in the gravitational wave detections. It didn't show up in the water rings. It didn't show up in the black holes. It didn't show up in the jets. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay, um, just a brief comment. One can do a more general thing and just replace, and all the accommodations will go through if one replace R plus uh, with, you know, having some not charge. The um, equations are exactly the same in this regime. And then if one can do some more general black holes, and these are called the care mod for modified um, theories of gravity where you have scalar tensor vector gravity in that in this alpha with a parameter that tells you how far away from GR you are, then those will uh, also have uh, similar uh, behavior in there. And um, so let me just go to the conclusions bit. So we reviewed uh, the, the title knife numbers and uh, kind of discussed a bit uh, these ideas of, of the deformations and the symmetries and looked up and insisted on, on having this type of hidden symmetries for black holes and saw that there are some indications that you are getting the information correctly, at least in a few uh, cases uh, in there. And since it's fall, uh, this is the tidal spinning in the farm. So we'd like to think about pumpkins and being these perfect objects. But there are huge ones that they love to grow here in the US, and they're very, very much deformed, basically because they're hollow in the middle. So that is the tidal squeezing in the farm. Bits of it. Yeah. So they're hollow inside. So they squeeze, they kind of, yeah. Maybe their black holes are like that. <laughs> okay, that's uh, everything. Thanks. Do we have any quick questions? Is there an understanding why these solid collections are captured by this approximation? Uh, mm, maybe they don't want to organize in SL2R times SL2R representations, and there is something. And at least it's showing you that the other symmetries that you wanted to have for the hidden symmetries are not really capturing that. And so the alternative could be this uh, in here. Because you means that we said that plot that the plot should reduce to the ground as a well, right? You mean if there's some connection with the other? I'm not sure they they're not I don't I don't think they are uh, actually related to each other. The this this computation generalizes the computation of the post right? No, it doesn't. No. I can show you exactly why they they keep in the and, and this is why I don't think it, it generalizes um so they only keep uh, terms, let me sketch something like this. So you have whatever, this is some other parts in here and they have omega dependence and we are doing some omega squared and there's some omega here, which is first or second order. So what all those two uh, proposals do is they keep different terms right. in the equation. Right that are only to omega order. So they truncate all of that. What we do is we select, if you want, right. some terms, but right. keep some omega square term. So the reason why I say that I don't think you can recover one from the other is that there's no way, even if I put a parameter here right. to tune this, to go to this regime right. in here. Because it's not the equation. It's a different equation. So, so the so, symmetries are not. So what is, so kind of what is this compute? What is this? Uh, 